Aloha everyone, it's Ajanette and I am here to do your human sexuality lecture for chapters 7 and 8. We're going to be covering attraction and arousal. They go hand in hand even though they're in separate chapters. One is focusing more on the psychological elements that draws two people together and the other is focusing on the physiological reactions to being drawn um, to, to someone. So let's first talk about chapter seven and attraction. This is kind of a long lecture. Um, I'll try to keep it brief, but you might want to pause in between or pause as you go. Take breaks in the middle, you know, chunk up uh, the lecture so that it, it gives you time to process it and um, just in, in to practice better study habits. Okay, so diving in. When we talk about interpersonal attraction, we're really talking about how much we like someone, how much are we drawn to someone, the, the, the um, strength of the love and connection that we have with another person. Now, we definitely have attraction to friends, to family members. You might have some um, siblings you're closer to or family members you get along better with or certain friends you click a little bit better with. Um, but we're going to focus primarily on romantic attraction for the purposes of this lecture as that's what coincides more with the human sexuality element. Attraction can occur between two or more people. So um, while we <clears throat> are going to talk a lot about um, research that's been done for heterosexual attractions, know that attraction also uh, can, can, these same factors can relate to uh, LGBTQ relationships, polyamorous relationships, so do keep that in mind. Uh, in terms of attraction, one of the, the most salient features or most obvious features is physical attractiveness. How attractive do you find a person to be? And that's one of the early determinants of attraction. We make an assessment based on what we see first. Um, for, for In some situations, it can be the strongest thing that draws us to another people. And in other situations, it's the only thing that matters. So it's really interesting that, um, you know, people value attraction differently. Even infants, uh, you know, within three months old, show a preference toward attractive faces. And you might say, well, how do we know this? Well, infants are studied through what we call habituation. So we look at how long they look at an object and then how quickly they process that information and they kind of become bored and disengage from that object. And then, um, you know, dis, uh, dishabituation can be like re-engaging with an object. And we definitely see um, that they have a preference. They will direct their gaze at attractive faces more readily than they do unattractive faces. So how important is attractiveness? Um, there is this incredible, what we call halo effect, where attractive people are given the benefit of the doubt. There, there's perks in the world. Um, my, my sister used to call it pretty privilege. Um, I got, when, when we would get pulled over, like I would, <clears throat> I would be able to get out of a ticket and she wouldn't. And she said, oh, that's because you're, you're pretty. Well, actually, I think it's because I was white, but that's another story. Um, but there definitely are benefits to being attractive. And there's a host of research that's been done on looking at how attractive people are treated differently in the world they are viewed more positively. So in whatever positive personality traits you can think of, um, they're typically rated higher for attractive people than they are people that would be classified as unattractive. They're deemed to be more honest, more warm, more compassionate. They also, interestingly enough, have better outcomes, like, you know, for a court hearing or academic outcomes, they are rated more favorably even by teachers. Um, they're also deemed to be more giving, more sociable, outgoing, even more intelligent than unattractive people, which, I, you know, I don't think there's a correlation at all between attractiveness and intellect, but they're perceived as being more intelligent. And that alone has an effect because there can be um, like a, a, a you know, where 
if you believe I'm intelligent, then I might actually perform differently to live up to that expectation. Uh, they, they get more um, opportunities for sex, you know, more people are attracted to them, and so they have more options than the average person. Uh, they also are more likely to get hired um, and uh, get a job than an unattractive person, and research shows that may, they may actually live longer. You know, they have all these added privileges in life, uh, which means they don't have the same degrees of stress and, um, and additional barriers in their life that may negatively impact their health and well-being. Um, and then here are some things uh, that also relate, like they're given in terms of outcomes. Better grades on essay exams, more successful on job interviews, lighter sentences, lower fines in court judgments. So these things permeate throughout every social system, our education system, our justice system, our medical system, even our financial systems. And so they are definitely things to, to consider. So when we talk about, you know, attraction, attractiveness, like, well, who's to say? I mean, it's Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So who's to say who's attractive and who's not? Well, interestingly enough, there are some common features globally, universally, that seem to be deemed attractive. The large round eyes are deemed as attractive, typically eyes that are a little bit further apart rather than um, closer together, a smaller nose as opposed to the larger um, the larger or flatter noses that you might see in my Hawaiian culture, um, prominent cheekbones, uh, and a larger forehead, not too tiny, but not, not too large either, right? Um, when you're talking about men, uh, we typically think of like a, a more structured, chiseled jawbone that's associated with that masculinity, right? Um, and more pronounced bone structure and cheekbones. We also think symmetry is attractive. Um, you know, side note, uh, I actually have a very crooked face and you can probably see that in the videos. When I take photographs, like I have my camera flip my photographs um, because that helps to kind of even out some of that um, asymmetrical um, bone structure but my face actually is crooked. And um, it's something that I, I guess I've been a little self-conscious of. My son has the crooked face. And when I was looking at a picture of my grandfather, um, I recognized, oh my goodness, that's where I get it from. And so now I take a little bit of pride in it, right? It's a little bit of my family heritage. But that facial symmetry is deemed as attractive. So someone like me that has that crooked face would not be seen as attractive. Um, and, you know, when you look at like models, they do very much have a lot of symmetry in their bone structure and in their body structure as well. You know, um, my daughters and I talk about this too because different areas of our body, um, it's very normal that you have like one breast larger, one breast higher than the other. Um, or, you know, your, maybe your leg, one leg's just a little bit longer than the other, one foot's just a little bit bigger than the other. The other. And that's very common, right? Um, so I don't think there's any such thing as 100% symmetry, but the appearance of symmetry um, makes one um, quote unquote more attractive. Also, familiar faces. So I know there's a lot of attention drawn to exotic looks, right? Um, unique and different looks. Um, but interestingly enough, people faces as being more attractive than faces that have very distinct looks to them. I think, don't think that's the case. Like with a lot of the Pacific Islander um, cultures, um, we have been exoticized, right? And so <clears throat> it, it very much does contradict some of those European uh, structures that are deemed to be um, more attractive. And so I think I'm frozen. Give me just a sec. I'm hoping that I come back, but I'm not sure if I will. Um, 
So you may or may not have on my side of the screen, it's kind of frozen, but if hopefully you still see my video on your side of the screen. In any event, um, all other things are healthy skin, uh, good teeth. Uh, we might perceive good teeth as um, whiter and straighter now. I don't know that that's been the case the, the entire time throughout the human species. Um, a nice smile is attractive. And then hygiene and grooming is also uh, considered to be attractive as well. Um, when you have an unkept look, it may not be as perceived as attractive. Youth is something that definitely is a huge determinant for attraction, um, particularly in uh, our current modern westernized society. We 100% prize a youthful appearance as being more attractive than an aging appearance. Um, Baby-faced children actually kind of um, catch some slack a little bit, get, get out of things a little bit um, more so than someone that doesn't have that baby face or that youthful appearance. And then when we talk about being attracted to someone romantically and sexually, uh, we typically are uh, drawn to someone with a more youthful appearance. And some of that uh, from an evolutionary psychology standpoint has been explained uh, in terms of reproductive ability. Youthful individuals are perceived as better mates because they are more likely to be able to produce offspring. Um, and so that definitely might be one of the factors, but overall, uh, particularly with modern media, uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to stay youthful looking. So there are definitely social and cultural factors that determine what constitutes um, attractiveness, right? And so those perceptions are gonna vary across cultures. In Western Eurocentric cultures, we definitely have a history of being drawn to thinness, right? Um, and you see over here to the right, that very thin uh, model, supermodel appearance and supermodels are often deemed to be the most beautiful women in, in the world. Um, and yet they're very thin and many of them actually qualify for a diagnosis of anorexia because they're 20% or more under the recommended body mass index for their particular um, height. And so uh, now again, this is often in westernized Eurocentric cultures uh, that value thinness, you see cultural variations in a lot of communities of color, including the Hawaiian culture, um, including black culture, uh, many of the, the Latinx cultures, you definitely see an appreciation for fuller, curvier body types. Uh, and um, the more they're exposed to these Western media, uh, you know, ideals, then the greater the risk of uh, eating disorders in their particular culture. Uh, you do see in modern times a, an increased growing preference, as you see in the bottom right, for very muscular um, women, very defined. Some may perceive it as masculine, but very athletic looking women. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know that I could ever look like that. Um, I don't even know that those muscles exist in my body anymore. So again, that also gets tied back to youth as well. Now there are gender differences in what is perceived as attractive. I will say that a lot of these uh, studies that have been done were very heteronormative. So there is a need for uh, more contemporary research that's more inclusive and does look at uh, attraction uh, with more diverse samples uh, and including uh, non-heterosexual relationships and attraction and even non-cisgender um, identities as well um, because we might find uh, that there are there are differences in the qualities that are deemed attractive in diverse communities. 
But across cultures, we do see that both men and women value physical attractiveness. Um, they also value kindness, humor, dependability, intelligence, and sociabil sociability. That makes sense. Like when you want a partner that's kind, that you can depend on, that you can laugh with, right? But for men, when you talk about what are you looking for in a prospective partner, physical attractiveness is most important to them and it's prioritized over status. Um, versus women, they prefer status. Again, from an evolutionary psychology standpoint, men from a reproductive standpoint, that youth and attractiveness indicates the ability to uh, have children and carry on their lineage. Whereas for women, um, we might be able to bear children, but we need a partner that's gonna help support us, take care of us. Um, and, and I don't mean like financially support us in modern times, but we need partnership in uh, raising our children together. And so social status, where a man has more stability financially or otherwise, tends to be more important for women. And you do see quite often uh, women are um, dating individuals of, of higher uh, economic, socioeconomic status and then maybe their own personal background came from. So this might be more common in cultures that are more patriarchal in nature, where you don't see women in the powerful, prominent position, where women are less educated, where they're poorer, and um, they don't have as much say in their reproductive rights. Interestingly enough, we saw this kind of shifting um, where more women were getting educated. Um, historically, though, in U.S. Uh, societies, women do have higher rates of poverty than men. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a shift in our reproductive rights. But most definitely when it comes to men uh, and women, men have greater flexibility and they don't have the legislative efforts to control their reproductive rights as we see with women. Age is also important. Uh, again, typically you will see men drawn toward uh, more youth, younger women, whereas uh, women uh, will quite commonly date older men, more related to status than the youth component. Um, and then also there's the hip to, to waist ratio referenced at the bottom again, maybe signaling um, health and reproductive ability. Now, why is all of this important? Um, not only does it kind of show the patterns and what we're drawn to, but we actually get some perks, right? So there's some pretty perks that come along with dating an attractive person or being in a relationship with an attractive person. Um, attractive people are socially, they are higher ranked, they get higher social status. We, we already talked about they're treated differently in society. So when we have a partner that's attracted, we get to kind of ride on those coattails and benefit from that. Um, additionally, uh, they're perceived as better partners and friends. And so within our own interpersonal relationships and our communication, we actually benefit. Um, because they may be treated differently in the world and consequently um, that allows them to behave differently within the relationship. Additionally, um, they might be more dominant, um, sexually warm, so there's some confidence there, some warmth there. Um, they also might have better mental health and functioning, uh, greater intelligence and social skills, or they may just have these benefits in society that allow them to grow in these areas in, in ways that maybe unattractive people are not given the opportunity or inspired or motivated to do so. And again, they receive those social benefits and they are more sociable, they are more popular um, and they don't have the same degrees of loneliness 
and the potential depression uh, that might result from somebody um, that is perceived as less attractive. So there's some perks, right? Um, but this also might be um, a good time to say, well, maybe we should also treat people um, with kindness regardless of what they look like. And maybe we should teach our children to actively reach out to all individuals uh, and to be mindful of these, these unconscious biases and preferences so that we're not also on the flip side, um, you know, excluding and treating people uh, with less kindness and less inclusion when they don't meet those uh, typical standards of attraction, or excuse me, attractiveness. So beyond what someone looks like, what else are we drawn to? What else are we attracted to? Well, interestingly enough, similarity. <clears throat> we are attracted to people who have similar um, values as us, similar perspectives, similar worldviews, similar interests. Uh, interestingly enough, it might reinforce your own values and interests. It might be because those people are in closer proximity to you, right? You're going to be drawn to people, and we'll talk about proximity in a bit, but you're going to be drawn to people that you're exposed to. And I can't be attracted to someone I've never seen, right? And so when you have somebody that shares your interests are going to be in the same place as you are doing the same things that you're doing. Um, and, you know, particularly in a very politically driven society that we are right now, um, or, you know, like religion is prominent in a lot of people's lives. Having somebody that shares those same views as you can really make life easy and simple. Um, I have a very dear friend of mine, he, you know, he and I dated, I absolutely love and adore the man, but we have very, very different political views, which are also a reflection of our different social and cultural values. And so there's a lot of contention in our relationship when things come up. And so we determine that's not, you know, healthy for a long-term partnership. So it definitely makes things easier. There's less disagreements and fights. Um, and so we typically are attracted to people who are similar to us, not just in, in our personality and our values and interests, also, interestingly enough, in what we look like in our attraction levels. So it's quite common to see people that are similarly rated in their attractiveness um, together in couples. And we often sit back and say, wow, how did she get him? Or how did she get her? Or how did he get her? When we see two people with quite disparate attractiveness levels. Um, and so, you know, that's something that comes from this social exchange theory where we make assumptions that if they're not similarly attractive or they're not in similar status, we assume that there must be some other benefit right? Um, that, oh, she must be good in bed, or, oh, he must be wealthy um, to have a girl that looks as hot as that, that type of thing. We make those assumptions because of this social ex exchange assumption, where we think that um, if there's not general similarity and other resource or benefit um, that is being offered in order to get that date. Um, or to get that partner. And, you know, we see these patterns hold true where wealthier men um, or famous men who are seemingly unattractive uh, have all of these women or partners, prospective partners fawning over them, uh, even though, you know, they might be deemed as very hideous or undesirable if they weren't famous, right? As I mentioned, proximity matters. I cannot um, be attracted to someone who I've never seen. And so it is definitely the first step is that exposure. Dating apps make um, people more available and more accessible that you wouldn't otherwise run into on the, you know, it may be you, you get to see someone from another neighboring town or 
um, even in other state, right? Long distance relationships have emerged. So proximity definitely is important. Um, and there is what's called a mere exposure effect, where the more you see someone, the more attractive you deem them to be. That fam familiarity, that similarity um, might breed a comfort in you and you might see them as being more attractive um, over time. And so that exposure, being around someone on a regular basis increases your liking. Now, some would argue that's because you're not just seeing them, but you're also getting to know them. And that could be the case. I'm not in any way um, dismissing that. But even think about just on a dating app, when you see a particular profile the first time, you're like, nope, nope, left, left. But when you see that profile a number of times, you might be more inclined to say, hmm, okay, and they might become more appealing to you over time. So test that. If you do dating apps, test that. See if that, that holds true for you. Now, when we talk about affect in psychology, we're talking about emotional expression. So interestingly enough, there is a positive correlation between mood and your perceived attractiveness. So people who are um, more optimistic, who are bright, who are cheery, who are happy, they are actually rated as being more attractive than people who are not, which is why you're encouraged to smile on your dating profile, right? Um, it's very important uh, that, you know, people get to see you as bright and bubbly. And this holds true more for women quite often. Um, I can't tell you how often I've been, I walk along and a man will tell me, smile, smile. And I hate it when it's smile, beautiful, or smile, sweetheart. It's so condescending and I honestly just want to kind of punch him in their face if I'm being honest. I don't know if as, you know, other women feel that way uh, who are watching this, but it can be very insulting. Um, women are often expected and pressured to put on a happy face, you know? I'm supposed to have a perfect, pretty face and be, you know, vacuuming and scrubbing toilets and high heels and I'm supposed to be bright and cheery all the time in order to be perceived as attractive. And frankly, that's not the way the human emotional experience works. Um, also, it's important to note that when we are experiencing attraction toward another, not only does our mood uh, make us more attractive, but being attracted to someone improves our mood. So there's a reciprocal relationship. Uh, when you, you might see this when you, um, you know, you see somebody's out perky and chippery after they've met someone, after they've started dating someone, after they've connected with someone. And so um, it's really interesting how those two things can, can support one another, right? Um, positive things <clears throat> or good things that might happen, like, um, like let's say, um, you know, I have a lotto ticket and I, I win $100 on that lotto ticket. Well, something positive like that before I go out on a date might actually make me more attracted to the person. So even if good things happen to me prior to meeting someone, it increases the likelihood that I'm going to be attracted to them. Um, and so that's why, like, you know, we're often attracted to humor. Somebody that has a, a, a great sense of humor and can make us laugh because there's that connection between um, mood and attraction. So if you want someone to be attracted to you, put them in a good mood or do something that's fun where you can go have fun. Um, interestingly enough, arousal also uh, can increase the likelihood that we'll be attracted to someone or someone will be attracted to us. So not, not only can you go do something fun, but go do something adventurous, take a hike, go, um, you know, go, uh, out on a boat, um, go, um, I, I can't even think, zip lining. <laughs> I'm like, I can't even think of what it's called. Um, but that physiological arousal from our autonomic nervous system when we're expressing or when we're experiencing 
you know, danger or fear um, can actually uh, increase the likelihood that we're attracted to someone. This also is uh, where we talk about um, trauma bonding too. When you experience trauma with someone, uh, you might have a really strong connection with them um, because that attraction increases during those arousal uh, experiences. And when we're talking about arousal from this context, from a psychological standpoint, arousal is the activation of your autonomic nervous system. It's effectively your stress response. Um, the sympathetic nervous system activates, your heart rate increases, your respiration rate increases, your blood pressure increases, um, your, your uh, pupils dilate, um, and you, you have this elevated um, energy level because uh, it's your fight, flight, or freeze response, right? And it doesn't matter whether it's riding a roller coaster or whether, you know, you just got in a car accident or whether you're nervous about a test. The same autonomic nervous system activates and it's the same physiological response, but it also releases neurotransmitters that um, make us more receptive to bonding and, and connecting with others. And that could be for survival purposes because we're more likely to survive a dangerous situation um, with partnership through, through a collective effort. And so interestingly enough, that arousal, that physiological activation of your autonomic nervous system increases uh, your um, your likelihood of connecting and bonding and being attracted with others. Um, we also see this like when you're talking about passion, right? When you're really passionate in a relationship, um, when there's those really strong uh, connections and we experience that heightened arousal, uh, we tend to get a little more attached to, to those people and it improves our sexual uh, attraction toward an individual when they do activate uh, the, that arousal response within us. So again, um, you know, if you want to be successful in your dating, go do something arousing together. Um, and, and hopefully in a safe way, enjoy that time. So what, what, what creates this? Yes, there's those release of the neurotransmitters, um, oxytocin in particular, and we'll talk more about that in the next chapter. But MHC genes have been connected uh, to uh, attraction as well. And MH, um, MHC genes uh, affect our scent, our pheromones, and females have shown a preference for, um, for these uh, scents that are different from their own. That makes sense, right? Um, we are attracted to someone with in, in a different scent than our own, um, and that might be, uh, again, for survival and reproductive purposes where um, we, we want to have um, that reproduction and, and genetic transfer with individuals who are not of, within our own family, right? Um, interestingly enough, scent gets ranked very high among women uh, when selecting mates. Um, and that's more important than their other sensory experiences. And um, it might also show that, um, you know, certain perfumes that we might be attracted to or colognes as well. There is the famous t-shirt experiment, experiment that you're seeing in page, or excuse me, on the right hand side of the screen, where um, uh, women will actually um, rate um, the smelly, um, so they have a man wear a shirt for three days, take it off, put it in a bag, seal that scent in, and then women smell the t-shirts the and they're more likely to rate a t-shirt that has an MHC uh, gene and scent that's different from their own. Um, and this is actually only the case for women who aren't on birth control. Birth control affects um, kind of how you how you process those scents uh, and, um, and the pheromone and your attraction to those pheromones. Other things is hormones, right? Hormones go through your entire bloodstream. 
oxytocin is one of the most prominent and um, it actually is often called the bonding hormone. So when mothers are nursing their infants, even when we are in labor, um, it is the, the same hormone that causes uh, the letdown reflex and lactation, but also contraction of our uterus. Um, we also release it when we orgasm. And so this particular hormone causes us to bond uh, with other people. It can cause us to bond with our baby. It can also help us bond um, with those that we're uh, enjoying intercourse with. And so oxytocin um, helps to, to fuel a sense of trust, closeness, connection, um, cooperation with others, and um, it helps us feel like we're in love with someone. Now, interestingly enough, menstruation impacts attraction. We are more attracted to men during the times that we've actually um, ovulated and when we are most fertile. And so when our bodies are wanting to fertilize an egg, we will be drawn to people. Uh, so lock yourself in the house during those times of the month. I'm joking, of course. Testosterone actually is the hormone that uh, is related to our sex drive. And it, um, for both men and women, just so you know, testosterone, all of the, the um, sex hormones, androgens, estrogens, um, and progesterones, men, all human beings have all of those hormones within their body. Typically, um, a, a cisgender male experiences higher degrees of testosterone than the other hormones, and typically a cisgender woman um, experiences higher levels of the estrogen and progesterone, but the testosterone is present in both of us and it does influence sex drive in both men and women, regardless of sexual orientation. So it definitely is critical to our sexual um, desires. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, it, it changes over the course of our relationship and lifetime where testosterone levels are lower in longer term relationships. So you often hear about how marriage like kills your sexual relationship. Eh, it could be related to the hormones where you don't need as much sex as you're in a longer term relationship. Maybe there's other things that are fulfilling about the relationship, but um, you definitely see lower levels of testosterone in married people. Now it could be, maybe the marriage reduces the testosterone or maybe the testosterone or the, or, or the, the marriage reduces the sex, which then reduces the testosterone or the testosterone lowers. And so there's not as much sex in marriage. We don't know which comes first, right? So it could be interpreted in a number of ways. Okay. So I'm going to stop there and um, actually do the chapter eight separately um, to hopefully, um, get my camera and video working properly again and um, and to also give you an opportunity for a little bit of a break so enjoy <laughs>